I was very skeptical initially of claims that solving the problems with the internet was a technological problem, but I think that a lot of social problems are downstream of technological problems, and so it's a matter of making the right choices at the deepest level of the foundation possible and then allowing that to like unfold into patterns that aren't as negative as like the current internet with like dopamine feedback loops and essentially digital drug addiction. All right, everybody, what's going on? This is the Other Life Podcast. I am Justin Murphy. This episode is one in a whole series all about Urbit. Urbit is a whole new computing and networking paradigm that many of you know I've become very interested in in recent months, really recent years, the past couple of years or so. I think Urbit is just way crazier and way cooler than most people realize. I think a lot of people are sleeping on Urbit and just don't really know about what's going on with it, what it is, and all the cool badass people building Urbit, building things on Urbit, creating on Urbit. And so now the development of the technology is really picking up and moving faster. I decided that when the Urbit annual conference came to town in Austin this past October, that I would sit down with 10 different people all across the network, people who are building the technology, people who are creating on the network, and people just in this culture that still I think a lot of people don't know much about. So I can honestly say this was one of the most interesting experiences I ever had at any kind of conference, to be perfectly honest. I spoke with CEOs, I spoke with engineers, I spoke with e-girls from weird theory Twitter. Like I'm not talking about Instagram chicks, I'm talking about like weird theory girls in you know, the other life neck of the woods of of the, the Twitterverse and the blogosphere. I talked with skitzed out writers and post everything podcasters. And very possibly I spoke even with an alien. Uh, I'm only half kidding. It was just wild, man. It was really, really wild. A really, really interesting set of characters you're about to meet over the next 10 episodes. And I'm just super pumped to bring this series out into the world. So Real quick, before I forget, I do want to let you know if you're interested in Urbit, it's now easier than ever to get onto the network. So I actually have a bunch of Urbit planets, aka Urbit ships, pretty much uh, computers in the cloud, an individual computer in the cloud that can be yours. It also functions as your identity, and it's what you use to log onto the network and to use Urbit. So if you want to, I'll give you one. Uh, I have a bunch, and any listener of the show, I want to get you on Urbit. So um, you can just go to imperceptible.computer. I made a whole site just for this purpose. And yeah, drop your email and uh, I will get you a planet, aka an Urbit ship. All right. Um, depending on whether you're listening to this now or two years from now, uh, there may or may not be some kind of uh, modest fee associated with it. Uh, right now, I'm just giving them out for free. You don't need to have any coding or programming skills or experience whatsoever. It's very straightforward. I will give you your own planet and you'll be on the network playing around talking to people in five minutes, probably. Okay. That's imperceptible.computer. I will put a link in the show notes. That's all from me. Let me get out of the way and on to the show. All right, Jonathan. So you studied during your PhD research, primarily quantum topology and topological quantum computing, specifically quantum compiling. Why don't we just start with what is quantum computing and why should anyone care? What are the kinds of interesting applications or implications that uh, people need to understand when it comes to quantum computing? Uh, yeah, so um, I got into quantum computing when I was an undergrad and just because I was into computing in general, but I was like, you know, uh, really into physics and especially, you know, uh, quantum physics. And it, it just seemed like a good way to combine those things. But, you know, at the time in like the late 2000s or so, it was still very far away seeming like there were only quantum computers of a few qubits and I can explain what that is in a moment. And, uh, you know, it was still just a 100% just research oriented thing. And, uh, so people weren't caring uh, a whole lot at the time about what it could be useful for. It's just what we wanted to get things that, that worked. Um, and, uh, so I, uh, yeah, ended up, uh, studying this particular architecture of quantum computers, the topological quantum computers that you mentioned, um, mostly because I just thought the math was cool. Uh, and it, it, it played to my strengths. Uh, I was good in, um, I was really interested in, in topology, but, uh, not as good at it at not as good at it as another field, uh, algebra and quantum topology just turns out to be the area of topology where you use a lot of algebra to study it and you don't actually need to be very good at topology. So I mostly just ended up on it just to play into my strengths. But, um, but the reason why, uh, yeah, people should like, uh, 
uh, be interested in, in it uh, to some extent, like right now, like I think still it's uh, mostly a, a research topic that, you know, someone who's interested in tech should try to like keep a pulse on it to some extent, but it's um, still far enough away to have a big impact that it's not something you need to be like sounding the alarm or anything. Um, and it's also still not like totally proven that it's really going to make a big difference in the world because it might actually turn out to be impossible to build a large enough quantum computer to make a big impact. But um, there are a, uh, uh, a few real world things that uh, in the sh like I'll talk about things in the short term that I think quantum computing uh, will be useful for or rather what is, you know, kind of widely perceived as the experts as being what will be a useful thing. And then I can talk a little bit about like what could happen if the technological trend continues um, so, uh, in the near term, uh, quantum computers that are being built by like Google and IBM and Intel and so on, um, they are mostly around a, uh, there's two main architectures that are kind of like the big ones right now, which are superconducting and ion trap and, um, superconducting are probably the ones you've heard about more like, uh, with Google's announcement of quantum supremacy, uh, I think it was like a year and a half ago now, um, maybe maybe a bit less, but anyways, um, and, uh, they, this is part of a wave of quantum computers that are being called, uh, near, uh, near term intermediate scale quantum computers, or I think, I think it's, it's NISC, N I S Q. Let me double check what that word is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Noisy intermediate scale quantum quantum computers. Uh, so, uh, Basically, th these are quantum computers that have, uh, uh, well, say around fifty or so qubits, and um, so I guess I should, you know, just trying to presume the audience doesn't know anything about quantum computers, so they are totally lost from the very start uh, what a qubit is. So, uh, sure. Um, so a, a a qubit is basically a any type of physical system that can have uh, one of two states that we're going to label zero, one, and, and that kind of uh, most common way to imagine this is maybe uh, a single atom spinning up or spinning down, which has to do with its uh, magnetic field. Um, and uh, the idea is that a, a ordinary bit, you know, can either only be in a zero or one and a qubit can be in some combination of both simultaneously. And the idea is that uh, when you uh, measure it uh, using uh, some technique, you'll it will force it to be either zero or one. So the uh, the quantum computer, while it's running, all the different qubits inside of it can be in some uh, superposition of both zero and one. But then uh, the actual data that you read out is always going to be a sequence of zeros and ones. And so the uh, I think the possibly most illustrative way to see how this is a big advantage over digital computers, at least for some types of problems, is by noting that. Um, the number of possible states that a quantum computer can be in uh, doubles for each additional qubit, uh, so, or at least one number of states it can like you know basically process simultaneously. So it's like a uh, you know if you have a bunch of classical bits, uh, you know the computer can only be in one state at a time. It means it can only process you know one uh, you know chunk of information at a time. Uh, with a quantum computer, because a qubit can be in both states at once, that means that you know for a single qubit. Uh, well, you can process, you know, some sort of uh, thing where it's, something is a zero or one. With two qubits, you have four possible states. So both are zero, both are one. You have one, zero, and one, one, or one, one, and one, zero. And then you add a third qubit, it doubles again uh, to eight possible states. So it's a, uh, so n qubits allows you to basically compute with two to the n possible uh, uh, states at once. And so this is kind of, I like to call it Moore's Law on crack. Uh, because instead of, you know, Moore's law, you know, being generally about, you know, the uh, amount of uh, uh, processing power of a computer doubling uh, every so often. But with quantum computers, in some limited sense, which I want to be, you know, uh, emphasize that this is like not exactly like the same sort of doubling computational power as Moore's law. But in some limited sense, uh, every additional qubit doubles the amount of information that it can work with at a given time. So. Um, this goes up very fast, but this is like a deal with the devil where it's like, OK, they're going to allow you to like compute with this enormous amount of information. But uh, going back to what I said, when you measure it, this is basically when you're 
you have to like have some sort of observations on the quantum computer that like read out data. And these are always going to be uh, a string of zeros and ones, not like some combination of them, uh, a zero or superposition. And so it's like, if you have 50 qubits, you're only going to be ever be able to read out 50 bits. So, so it's like, you'll, your algorithms can be working with two to the 50th power, uh, uh, possible, you know, states, um, simultaneously. Hi. Um, and I, I, I want to clarify that what I mean by simultaneously in a moment, but, um, but you only be able to read out 50, 50 of those bits. And so you have to somehow figure out a way to get the information for your very, very complicated problem that requires manipulating a huge, a huge amount of data at once and kind of compress the result that you want just to 50 bits. So it's not, uh, quite as amazingly super o OP as, uh, as it would be, uh, otherwise. Um, but okay fascinating so i know i know that there are big debates around you know are quantum computers going to break blockchains or totally change this or change that and kind of setting that aside for a minute is the development of quantum computing is that itself speculative like what is the probability that quantum computers do indeed develop at all and become a thing at all is that is that set in stone for sure we just debate the implications or is the whole field kind of speculative like whether or not there's even going to be quantum computers is still an open question uh yeah that, that's a really good thing to drill into and especially anybody interested in quantum computers should spend a lot of time looking into people who are i want to call them naysayers because it's just good science to be to just try to do everything you can to prove something wrong um but you know there are uh several people out there uh, probably the one name that gets the most press is uh, this, I think, Israeli uh, scientist, Gil Kalai. And he's uh, proven some theorems that basically show that if you have some sort of presumption on what form the errors will take in a quantum computer, um, and I'll say a bit more in a second about what I mean by errors, um, then once you get past a certain size that's that's relatively small, like, you know, may, he thought it was smaller than the size necessary for quantum supremacy, but um, but that seems to have not been the case, uh, that there basically there'll just be so many errors introduced as you scale it up that it'll be impossible to do anything. Um, and so this problem with uh, error correction is kind of the main both science and engineering challenge with most quantum computer architectures right now, where it, it's basically uh, because the physical systems used to encode qubits are so uh, sensitive to the conditions that they're in, like they have to be close to absolute zero Kelvin. They have to, uh, you know, be in a place that's like completely sealed off from any kind of vibrations. Uh, you know, they're just, you know, extremely delicate systems that, uh, any kind of like outside interaction will just immediately destroy your computational state and make it so that your result is worthless. So, uh, so there's, uh, something called like coherence time where you try to like, you know, see how long can you maintain a qubit state? And at the moment, the, that's long enough. It's like, you know, I don't know. I don't remember exactly what it is like less than 50 milliseconds. Um, which is long enough to do maybe 30 to 50 or so operations on a qubit before basically the environment will create so much destructive interference that your computation is destroyed. So um, resolving this error correction problem is uh, going to be the largest challenge, I think, going forward in like the next uh, decade or probably much longer. Um, and the degree to which you have to correct it is... Um, kind of insane like uh so to have a uh perfectly error corrected qubit you need to uh using something like a superconducting superconducting quantum computer like uh google has made you need something on the order of a thousand to ten thousand like physical qubits all working together just to represent a single logical qubit that like basically is immune to error and uh so that's way way bigger than any quantum computer right now and so it's like so things like uh, Shor's algorithm, which are one of the one of the algorithms that people say will like break cryptography, they you know in theory only require you know uh, maybe several hundred or a thousand qubits to say break uh, um, elliptic curve cryptography or RSA or something like that. But uh, that's with like perfect like like logical error corrected qubits and not with like the actual physical ones we're working with. So. Okay. Um, and so like for something like breaking cryptography, you need with something like 
the superconducting architecture closer to like a thousand or sorry, a million uh, qubits, something, something around there. And that that could be quite a ways away, like probably at least 10 years, maybe 20, maybe never because of this error correction problem that uh, that uh, Gil Kalai has written a lot of papers about and, you know, continues to insist that, you know, we're going to hit a limit at some point and basically it will be impossible to handle the errors. Um, but uh, OK, interesting. And do you do you personally believe that quantum computers are going to have significant applications and are going to become a increasingly ubiquitous part of the world? Uh, definitely to some degree. But yeah, because of the unknowns around error correction, it's hard to say if it will have like the, the maximum impact it could. But um, like right now, so the reason that the current area of quantum computers is called the noisy intermediate scale ones is because of basically this error problem. But uh, it turns out that there are a lot of uh, problems that don't require error correction to uh, really work out. Um, in fact, uh, like, for example, we know that quantum processes are involved with certain biological phenomena like photosynthesis and how birds uh, determine the direction of the magnetic field and so on. So we know that and they evolve like quantum entanglement to some degree. So like we know that like there has to be some protected, some quantum state inside of like very hot, like noisy biological systems that, you know, basically there are, there has to be errors being introduced all the time, but the kind of algorithm or process is robust enough that the errors don't matter. And so uh, it seems like the, like that. And, and another uh, example of this would be the uh, D wave quantum computers, which are, wouldn't it be called universal quantum computers? They're also, they're called quantum annealers, which basically just means they only want run one algorithm called the quantum annealing algorithm. And they're useful for things and th they don't care very much about error correction, basically. Uh, and th so far, those have been applied to things like uh, determining the most efficient routes for traffic which, uh, you know, sounds a bit mundane, but, you know, that's actually an extremely, like, basic problem with, like, resource distribution in general. It's like, it's not just related to cars, it's related to supply chains in general. And, um, okay. and so there's, uh, I think, definitely applications uh, that will be uh, come into play in during this decade with with things like supply chains or traffic. Um, but, uh but it's harder. But for things like personalized medicine, where like you, uh, you know, put your DNA into a quantum computer and it figures out the exact molecule that's going to like, you know, cure your disease or uh, or like, you know, designing um, materials with arbitrary properties and so on, which are like, you know, things that people have kind of fantasized and maybe hyped about quantum computers, but like they require uh, the, the full like error correction level of things that we don't know if it's actually going to happen or not. And same with breaking cryptography, like that's uh, that requires the full error corrected universal quantum computers, which um, may may or may not ever exist. OK, fascinating. That was an awesome primer on a really interesting and, and difficult topic. So that was great. Appreciate that. And I'll, uh, I and the audience will look into the guy whose name you cited to, to kind of see the, the bear case on on why maybe quantum computers won't break the blockchain anytime soon. So I'd love to learn now a little bit more about how you first got Urbit pilled. You know, what was your what was your introduction to Urbit? Uh, but but specifically, when was it that you first were like, oh, I'm really into this. I want to be a part of this. And why why did you think that way? Uh, well, I don't think my my story is terribly interesting, but I will uh, you know go into it anyways. So that's all right. Uh, Just curious. Um, so yeah, during grad school, I. Well, I was interested in cryptocurrency basically since close to the beginning. Like I uh, used like Silk Road to buy weed in like 2011 or something. And <laughs> um, and, you know, didn't keep any of the Bitcoin then because I was just it, I was just like, this is too weird. I don't know. I don't have any money anyway. So I'm, you know, uh, didn't keep any of it. Um, and uh, but I've been, been following peer to peer and cryptocurrency stuff for uh, basically ever since, even though it was kind of a, uh, uh, you know, side quest from anything related to quantum computers. But uh, so I got involved like in a serious way, I guess, with the sort of crypto world in 2018 when I found out about a project called a uh, hollow chain. Have you heard of that at all? I've heard of it. I don't know a ton 
though. Um, so uh, Hollow Chain is part of a. Uh, the thing that actually got me into it was a, a the project that spawned Hollow Chain. So I'm going to talk about that instead, um, which is even more obscure. But um, but it's actually uh, has a lot in common with Urbit. Um, so there's uh, so Hollow Chain is basically a project about building. Uh, distributed applications that are run on the devices of the users and it like has a fairly different architecture from urbit like it makes a big use of like uh distributed hash tables and um so it's kind of like almost a combination of distribute of like bit torrent and git and hash change um but it's, it's it's only for running applications it's not like a whole whole os like urbit and but it's uh supposed to be the uh part of a larger OS uh, project called Scepter that is kind of uh, a, it's a, it's an operating system that was worked on for a few years, I think in the late 2000s, early 2010s, um, but then kind of put aside to focus on the hollow chain part of it. Um, but it's, its idea was to sort of borrow ideas about uh, how nature coordinates in like natural complex systems like forests or fungal colonies and so on um and apply apply those ideas about coordination to operator operating system architecture and i thought this is really cool because i think nature has is the best decentralizer like you look at you look out at natural systems and there's there's no sort of top down control anywhere it's like forests just run entirely by themselves they just keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger and uh um and like multicellular organisms, like there is a brain that, you know, has some degree of control over some parts of it. But for the most part, it's all just cells talking with their neighbors and they they are able to use a very sophisticated signaling mechanism to somehow make, you know, billions or trillions of, of you know, semi-autonomous individuals coordinate in a way that's better, best for the whole. And so. Uh, right. And the brain itself, the brain itself is decentralized. It mm -hmm. literally runs through the body. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I thought this was all just really cool, and uh, and so I uh, ended up uh, I started a blog uh, that was sort of sort of uh, spurred by this, but I had a couple of other reasons too. That and my my blog it was never got very popular. I only wrote for it for maybe eight months, um, but it did end up having a big impact on how I ended up on Urbit. Um, but it like I wrote about a combination of uh, quantum computing. Uh, decentralized and distributed computing and uh, uh, qualia computing. So like computational properties of qu consciousness. And, you know, I had some, you know, vague, you know, hypotheses about like how the three are connected, which, uh, you know, certainly are and no, nowhere near being proven. Um, but, you know, it was just a, a fun series of topics that I knew I could write a lot about. Um, so eventually I, I started writing about hollow chain in that direction just because it was sort of this biologically inspired computing this distributed computing idea and um and then they they ended up finding out about me and I ended up being hired to work on hollow chain for uh for a period of time but I was still in and okay yeah could you could you briefly just uh recapitulate the thesis of that paper uh the or blog post or essay uh well i mean it was like a, a series of them but it was like uh my so my basic uh motivation for it was this idea that comes out of quantum topology actually that is uh about the dihedral angles in like the backbones of macromolecules like proteins or rna uh, where it's like, you know, protein like folds up and such, and it has like a sort of backbone molecule with amino acids attached to it. And when it folds up, the, it forms all these different angles. And like, you know, the geometry of the protein kind of determines its functionality. And, uh, you know, th these sort of uh, pr predicting these angles has been kind of a, you know, thing in popular science for a while with like folding at home, people do on their, used to do on their PlayStation and so on. Um, and But there's this interesting facet in or interesting idea related to it where uh, you can actually, to some degree, predict these angles, uh, which are more generally called something called a Ramachandran plot, uh, using methods that come out of quantum topology. And this is kind of just completely out of left field. Like, it doesn't seem like this, like, weird field of, like, quantum matter at extremely low temperatures and, like, very extreme conditions of magnetic fields and such uh, should have anything to do with biology. Um, but, uh, but you can actually predict these angles uh, using a method that comes out of quantum topology called uh, uh, like moduli space of Riemann surfaces, which maybe you'll mean something to some of your listeners. 
Um, yeah, but this, this, uh, this connection is entirely still using like sort of the classical idea behind it. Like there's a way to associate a quantum system to this, but like, it doesn't, it's not innately associated with these angles. Like you only need to use the classical physics to determine the angles. Um, but that means that, uh, basically there's this way to associate a unique quantum system to this, uh, to this model. And usually that's not the case in physics. Usually you have one sort of like classical system, and then you have a lot of different ways to sort of like zoom in and give it, get sort of different kinds of class of quantum physics that all look the same when you zoom way out. So having only one way to go from a classical system to quantum system is very unusual in physics. Uh, and the idea is that, uh, basically because this, because this is the same kind of mathematics you can use to describe the behavior of topological quantum computers is that if there is sort of like an additional level of like uh, quantum information associated with like folded up proteins and RNA and so on, um, that, you know, is kind of protected from the environment by the folded up molecule, uh, then when two different molecules come to each other and exchange, you know, they change their shape a bit and they kind of, they seem to exchange some kind of information because they go off and do different behaviors after they interact, uh, that that might be it's seen as some sort of, um, uh, uh, interaction between two different, very specialized, like quantum computers. And so then you could think of a bio biological organism as being a extremely large scale, like distributed, uh, quantum computer that handles error correction using the same way that like topological quantum computers use. And so like, so this really excited me the idea that, okay, uh, you know, even though it's kind of really going like off the deep end in, in, in some, in some ways, it's sort of like, you know, the Overton window of, of physics and, and, uh, and science, but, um, and this hasn't been like proven in, in a way by experiment. And probably we can't, at least anytime soon, we have to simulate uh, model, uh, protein folding on, on quantum computers, but um, this idea that biological organisms are like sort of decentralized quantum computers, and maybe there's some something to do with qualia, uh, and uh, you know that that's what excited me. That's what I started writing about, and so that's also why I ended up intersecting with the uh, hollow chain and scepter because they were all about trying to build like a global uh, distributed operating system that's inspired by the, the behavior of uh, multicellular organisms and such. Um, okay, awesome. That was fascinating. That was a very worthwhile tangent. So that paper gets the attraction of the Holochain crew. You start working for them. And so how does that then uh, bring you to Urbit? Uh, yeah, so I, I worked on Holochain uh, sort of just part-time while I was still doing grad school um, and eventually ended up leaving for various reasons that I don't need to get into. But uh, I went to start a startup with several other uh, ex hollow chain people related to agriculture um basically an agri agriculture tech thing and this is how i got led into like the iot stuff is like we wanted to have like sensor networks um and to like understand how to build like farms that worked like forests where you didn't need to maintain them because the like uh heterogeneous like uh like different uh, uh cultures all next to each other all have feedback loops that kind of like work together in a harmonious way that makes it so that you only really have to come and harvest things and you don't have to like, you know, keep adding in more energy and labor and, and, and resources to keep things going. Um, but, uh, that ended up, uh, not working out for, I mean, it was a very, very early stage thing. Like we got like some, pre we got some pre-seed funding. Um, we were called quadrivia group for what it's worth. Um, but yeah, it ended up not working out. So then, um, come towards, uh, and I'm finishing my, my, uh, my PhD and the, the company is, is, uh, seeming like it's not going to work out. So I have to find another job and somebody, uh, Sam Frank, who I think you had on the blog on this yeah. or yeah, podcast recently. On the podcast, uh, yeah, yeah. He had been reading my blog. Uh, I guess, like I said, I had a very small audience. I would guess less than a thousand people ever read it. Um, so it was really just happenstance. Um, but yeah, I, we were friends on Facebook as a result of that. And that, uh, and then he told me like, Hey, they're, they're hiring at Talon and, you know, forwarded my, my resume. And at the time I had heard of Urbit, but I think, I, I think I saw the website for it for in like maybe 2018, maybe 2017. I read it for like 20 minutes. I didn't get it at all. And, uh, because 
Uh, there's just so many projects in crypto. I, and I, you know, I didn't really felt like I had a pretty good feel for it that I felt like if I didn't understand something in 20 minutes, then I'm just going to move on to the next thing. So I just, I, I, I didn't really, I, I vaguely remembered it had something to do with personal servers and there was a programming language and that was all I really knew. And so like, I kind of like came to Talon with like only barely understanding what Urbit was about. Uh, this was like mid 2019 when I started at Talon. Um, so, uh, uh, it was, Urbit was still like very bare bones at the time. Like I, like there wasn't any, uh, landscape yet. And, uh, um, so it, like it was, it was, you know, it, for somebody that, you know, understand something by using it, it was still hard to get into, especially cause I didn't really have a huge computer science background. Like the quantum computing stuff, you might think it has a lot to do with computer science, but it's actually almost entirely physics and math. Like I didn't do any programming in grad school. Um, okay. Interesting. And so now when you look at the Urbit ecosystem and you think about it, what, what do you find most attractive? What do you find most exciting or compelling or, or, you, you know, you could be honest, if, if maybe you're still just uh, getting paid to, to do work for Swan <laughs> and that, that's your, that's your position. Uh, yeah. So I would say it took me like, you asked how I got Urbit pilled eventually. Yeah. So I wasn't Urbit pilled when I joined Talon. Like really, I just wanted a job, <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> sure. but the, uh, it, I would say after about like six months or so, I, you know, I thought after maybe a month or two, it was like, okay, this is pretty cool, but like, it's just too fucking weird. Like there's just like, like this new language and new, everything is like, how is anybody ever going to want to learn all this stuff? And, but then, um, after I think six months or so, once I had absorbed enough of parts of the system, I started realizing that like all the weird choices that went into Urbit that just don't make contact, don't make sense in like the current context of the internet, uh, like all kind of fit together like puzzle pieces and they form like a coherent whole that uh, that when appreciated by itself, once you understand all the parts, like it actually just fits together really coherently. And I was like, OK, and then at that point, I was like, I'd become very impressed by Urban. I was like, OK, this is actually uh if it's not Urban itself that succeeds, the idea is so correct that. Uh, something like it will come along. So I've just called this the the herbitoid, which is just kind of borrowing what math terminology. We just add oid onto anything that um that is like the thing they're studying, but like slightly different, I guess. Um, so it's like so so I've you know at least was at that point very convinced that personal servers with unique uh decentralized identities are the they have to be the end state of the internet, or at least in the in the for near by foreseeable future, like next ten to twenty or maybe hopefully not 30, but you know, in, in the near future, that has to be where it goes. Cause everything about the current internet is so dysfunctional that I just, you know, block out the idea that it's going to last forever. It's like, this can't last forever. Um, okay. Fascinating. Uh, but, and, and so how do you, how do you imagine that the world gets pulled out of its current equilibrium into this totally new equilibrium? Because of course, you know, you, you can agree with you that the 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 end state of Urbit is better for everyone. And there could still be a kind of insurmountable uh, coordination problem where it's kind of stuck in its local uh, maximum, right? So how do you how do you think about uh, the logic of that tra transition? Why it's likely how how it might uh, come about? How do you think about that? Uh, yeah, so my thinking about that is actually inspired a lot by uh, my work on Holochain and Scepter. Um, so uh, Scepter was developed to be something called a grammatic capacity, which is a term that they, I believe, invented. Um, it might have, uh, and it's in the context of like complex adaptive systems theory. And so for any listeners who are not familiar with this topic, uh, complex adaptive systems are kind of this very multidisciplinary area of study where you look at agents that all have like sets of rules that they can they can use to interact with each other and maybe an environment they can interact with. Um, and the idea is that uh, uh, things like cities are examples of, of human complex adaptive systems or society itself, um, the internet, uh, um, but also things like forests and so on. Uh, and also things down to like, you know, the level of like uh, intracellular interactions can be thought of in the in, in these terms. So it's kind of like a very uh, wide ranging field of topic, and it does have some uh, some mathematically rigorous parts of it, but some parts of it are also uh, uh, kind of more, I guess, qualitative. But anyway, so a grammatic capacity is supposed to be a informational infrastructure that uh, greatly enhances the agency of 
uh, and what you know the capabilities of individual agents. So that uh, examples of this uh, in human society would be things like invention of speech, uh, invention of writing, invention of the printing press, invention of the uh, internet. Uh, uh, yeah, invention of the internet. And basically, if you think about it, like, all of these things like led to very large scale uh, changes in society, like the printing press, you know, uh, allowed technology to sp spread much faster and allowed ideology to spread much faster, allowed for things like, you know, uh, corporations to, to take a uh, hold. Uh, internet obviously has a lot of uh, 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 things that we're all familiar with now, like, uh, you know, led to things like Uber and Facebook and all these other sorts of things. So, um, and then, but also like rewinding, it's not even necessarily something uh, specific to human society, uh, like the invention of uh, DNA and RNA are what led to multicellular organisms. So the idea is that, uh, it, and all of these things have a common common element, which is that you have basically a system of agents, you have a system of carriers, which are basically things that can move uh, signals between agents, and you have signals that live on those carriers, and then you have protocols, which are how agents take in signals over carriers and then use it to determine their own behavior and do something else uh, based off of that information. And so uh, the way I think that you could think of how each one of these invention of a grammatic capacity kind of uh, led society from what seemed like a very, uh, um, very solid kind of or like stable state where it's like, how could we ever escape feudalism? Or how could we ever escape uh, tribalism? Or how could we ever escape capitalism? It's I think it's always because when you introduce uh, a bunch of new capabilities to individual agents and allow them to basically form their form new ways to signal each other than this kind of in some sort of like very like abstract, like high dimensional configuration space creates like an attractor for like society where it's just like, okay, now that Asians have a new uh, set of capabilities, this old system is no longer nearly as effective at handling the uh, needs of that society as it was before. And these new sets of interactions create new ways of organization and, 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 and collective behavior such that it sort of like, yeah, creates this attractor that's away from where society currently is and just kind of leads into it. So I think that Urbit is an example. Like, so I said, Scepter was designed to be a grammatic capacity and it was designed pr pr particularly to be something that, you know, a grammatic capacity for the expression of grammatic capacities, but, um, and that's how they came up with the architecture, but I don't think that's specific to, to Scepter at all. And I think it's possible to have like lots of types of agency increasing technologies, um, that could have an effect of that sort. And so I think Urbit would fit into that category as, you know, it, since it allows you to basically completely escape out of the, uh, like paradigm of the current internet and allowed new forms of organization and interactions and such that were previously never possible. And so I think that that uh, is basically the, the type of thing that you need to make sort of the sort of phase transition from wherever our current society is to wherever Urban will take us with, you know, QAnon murder cults or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, that, that was fire. So that's very interesting. So in the Urban model, then it's something like the individual users or ships are the agents they send signals both to to themselves on Urbit, but also out into the clear web, the boomer web. And through some kind of accumulation of energy, there is a uh, phase shift where everyone out on the boomer web is seeing all of these signals passing through. And uh, at a certain threshold, uh, Urbit becomes kind of irresistibly more attractive. Or something like this. So, yeah, yeah. what and I think you just you yeah. described it very well with your article about Urbit earlier this year, comparing it to Thomas Kuhn's like theory about the structure of scientific revolutions. And I think I think I'm basically kind of just redescribing that in a different way. Okay, right. So in in that model, basically there's this accumulation of error in the dominant paradigm. Uh, there are more and more kind of anomalies, phenomena that the dominant scientific paradigm can't explain, and as that error term accumulates as the gunk in the dominant model accumulates, then a new paradigm becomes increasingly attractive. People are increasingly prone to uh, prefer a new model if it can explain away all of those accumulated errors. And what you're saying is that in the current technical paradigm, there's so much accumulated error, there's so much gunk clogged up in how computing is conducted today, 
that as that accumulates more and more, people are going to be more and more prone to choose a completely different uh, architecture, even if the switching costs are are significant. So what are what are some of the potential roadblocks, or maybe maybe from your memory of this uh, complex systems literature, you know what what are some of the key criteria that determine whether or not a phase shift actually occurs or fails to occur? Because we can, of course, think of many contexts where some superior product uh, fails to make the transition. Right, that it seems like it has everything that would be required to be a superior paradigm, but uh, you know the the population stuck where it is, and it's in its local maximum is just never really able to to get out of that into the new equ equilibrium. Like, what are some other interesting concepts or heuristics that are really important for people to think about as we try to evaluate what it would take for Urbit to take over the world or fail to take over the world? Uh, yeah. So I would say that, especially in the context of like open source software, uh, basically having a uh, sort of feedback loop that uh, allows the project to, to, you know, sustain itself by um, basically like creating value and then feeding it back into itself is a large part of it. Like, for example, with Linux, Linux is, you know, the internet runs on Linux, but it's never really taken off in terms of like the desktop. And I think that's uh, a large part due to the insufficiency of like economic incentives to develop that. And, um, like those economic incentives did exist for, uh, for, for running servers and such because Mac and windows are, were never designed for like handling thousands of simultaneous connections and users. So Lin Linux or Unix, I rather, I guess was the only game in town, but with desktops, uh, because there was, you know, a lot of economic incentive to build, uh, at least a very user-friendly desktop, uh, that, you know, I think that kind of led to windows and Mac taking over, um, which are not open source. And so because they are closed source and they are, you know, uh, products in like a capitalist system that kind of gives them that feedback loop that they needed to, uh, to, to succeed. And the thing that I think differs with Urbit from other open source projects is the address space that kind of creates this feedback mechanism. Um, so that, uh, you know, you, a speculator buys address space and they want their address space to be worth more. And so then they, you know, either give or, you know, sell it to other developers who then, you know, make it worth work better. And, um, this, this kind of thing is common, I guess, across, uh, a lot of blockchain type projects like Gitcoin, um, and, uh, you know, Ethereum does this to an extent and, and a lot of others, but I think Urbit, my impression being kind of mo more familiar with Urbit than, basically any other crypto project at this point uh is that urbit has this done very very well uh and um that this is the type of mechanism of incentives that is needed for an open source project to kind of get beyond these uh barriers that are there it's like well like you know it's just harder to get people to work on anything for free so uh if when those economic incentives are introduced that I think, you know, it's not I would not say that's uh, sufficient to to get past like the this issue, but it is probably necessary. And I think the other fact factor of Urbit basically being a first mover here by a very huge margin, um, like the uh, the only like I said, the only other project I think like that even is sort of comparable to Urbit is Scepter. But like uh, Scepter and Scepter was also started like before Bitcoin. So it's um, but, uh, but it's it very different type of approach to it. And then they're probably, you know, still at least several years behind getting to where Urbit is. Like I would say like the, the apps that are available on Holochain right now are comparable to the ones available on Urbit, uh, but they don't have an entire operating system girding it uh, that will kind of, because uh, like, you know, because just having the app, app, app layer is just one part of the problem of escaping the uh, like all encompassing, uh, uh, control over, over like systems of the current internet. Like you have to be able to escape it entirely while, uh, and I, uh, and you know, initially, and that was one of the things that other, I uh, had to become convinced of over time is that I, you know, I, th I, I thought the internet was fixable that, you know, you could probably just build a really, uh, a new protocol or something that, um, but, uh, but yeah, after working on Urbit long enough now, I, and, and, just understanding just like just how deep that the problem with how the internet ended up the way it is, is rooted that I think the kind of narrative that's been built around Urbit that it's event essentially boils down to the fact that the internet was built on systems that, 
uh, for on Unix, which, you know, is, is best for thousands of connections and thousands of users. And that, you know, created complexity in doing any kind of peer to peer thing and created problems with, uh, with spam and this just creative kind of, by kind of a sort of process of gradient descent, this process where different like large corporations just deal with all the complexity for you because it's not, uh, can't be addressed by most individuals or, 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 or professionals that, you know, like IT people. Um, and uh, this, you know, then they put a kiosk in front of it and then we ended up where we we're at. And so like, I, you know, I, I was very skeptical initially of claims that uh, the solving the problems with the internet was, a technological problem, but I think that a lot of social problems are downstream of technological problems. And, 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 that, but it's also the case that lots and lots of technological choices have are bad social sociologically downstream. And so it's a matter of making the right choices at the deepest level of the foundation possible. And then allowing that to like unfold into, uh, uh, patterns that aren't as negative as like the, uh, current internet with like dopamine feedback loops and, you know, essentially digital drug addiction. Totally. Okay. Fascinating. That was excellent. So tell me a little bit more about how you see the future of Urbit. Uh, it came up in a previous podcast. Someone mentioned that you have some wild takes on in particular, the, the internet of things phenomenon and how that's going to over time link up with Urbit. Could you, could you paint that future for us a little bit? Uh, yeah. So I, I, I would say that the, Best thing to read for this that I've written is on the urbit.org blog. Uh, I think it's called Lunar Urbit something, something about moons. Um, but this okay, is, I'll put a link in the show notes. But uh, this is uh, entirely just a, I, I'm not an expert on IoT at all. This is just something that, you know, I've, you know, mostly just observed, uh, at least from a consumer standpoint, just how terrible it is in the sense, in the sense that, you know, all your, all these IoT products, they they phone home, they give away your data, and then if the company that builds them dies, then your device is useless, and that's just, uh, you know, so useless. So I I don't own any IoT stuff, at least unless you call like a Raspberry Pi, uh, and RG Widows I do I do like to mess around with those, but those don't phone home. But anyways, uh, so uh, my interest in this came out of like I said the previous startup that I did, Quadrivia Group, which was about uh, agricultural technology, especially like sensor networks and um, how you can use like data driven um, uh, ideas to decide how to plant farms that have like more like closed feedback loops in them. And uh, so so the article that I wrote was primarily from the point of view of industrial IoT, where it, you want to have like lots and lots of machines that you own because you're like a corporation or whatever, or just a large, you know, farming co-op or something. And, you know, relying on other people is, 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 uh, that are companies that are going to, uh, possibly go away or stealing your data is just, you know, it's not as good as having all your own shit. So, um, so moons in orbit, uh, for, uh, any listeners that are unfamiliar, uh, every single, Galaxy, star, and planet can spawn uh, two to the thirty-second power, so about four billion moons. And at at the moment, these are sort of like uh, uh, there there are orbit ships, and they run the exact same software as every, everything else. But instead of their key being located on uh, the Ethereum blockchain, their uh, keys are kept by their parents. Like you know, and I'll just say that their parents is always a planet for now, uh, just to keep things simple. Um, and what this ends up being kind of analogous to is how the current internet works with like accounts on maybe Facebook or Google or anything else in that like they hold the keys to your account. Um, so that's why they have power over you. That's why, you know, you can just lose your account anytime and all the data on it and all your connections and so on. Um, and, you know, it's because you don't actually own it. And it's the kind of the same way with moons versus their planet is that these are are our child identities that the planet can revoke at any time. Like if the moon misbehaves, like maybe if someone steals it or if you gave it to someone and they start spamming or a lot of different things. So it's like, uh, you know, the idea of urban is generally about like individual sovereignty, but the address space is designed in such a way that it actually has, uh, the possibility for old patterns in it. But, um, but the old, the old system, uh, what it was, uh, designed in such a way that these uh, 
uh, the individuals basically couldn't, individuals had to be moons. So it's like when you log into Twitter or you log into Instagram and Facebook and so on, you're logging into different moons, but you don't have access to like a planet that controls all them. So it's like you are, you're, we're, we're basically living in a kind of lunar era from an urban point of view of the internet and that uh, urbit uh, allows everybody to ascend to the level of having a server and, and, and gaining individual sovereignty that way. So anyways, the idea that, okay. So, right. So sounds like in your model, then my moons that I spawn with my planet would be my kind of local household uh, network of sensors. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 like the general idea is that moon should be used for devices. So it'd be like, yeah, for your phone, for, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe your thermostat or something, but, uh, and like, but like, you know, in, in a, in a world where, uh, you know, you want to have like, uh, as much, uh, data about the, your environment as possible, you don't want all the data go to go going through a third party. So it should go to your planet instead. Um, and I think in the context of things like, uh, industrial settings, uh, I, I have an easier time imagining why someone would want to do this uh, personally. And uh, so it's like you want to be able to like gather up all the data about, you know, how all your crops are doing and the soil quality and the humidity and the different species that you have and so on. And then you because you actually own that data, you could then uh, sell it on a kind of, uh, you know, distributed data market where, you know, you trade uh, data with other farmers and such. Uh, in, in so you, that you find out more broadly about like, how is the local ecosystem doing? And then all this data can kind of be stitched together into like larger and larger amounts of data that, uh, is all, instead of being like, uh, uh, accumulated by some like mega corporation, um, because of the, you know, way that you could do permissions on Urbit, which this isn't really implemented totally yet, but like you could have ways that so that like someone can only merge your data with their data if you gave them explicit permission to do so. Um, and then you could even go even further and include things like zero knowledge proofs to basically give uh, show that like I collected data correctly. I ran these computations on it, but I'm just not going to tell you exactly what all these computations were because of privacy violations or whatever. And but I can give you like a, a zero knowledge proof of it along with it. It's like this is these are the things you have to plug into your algorithm um, and these uh, in order to like, you know, understand like what this data means but like it doesn't actually like reveal like oh this was collected by you know joe our farm farmhand and uh and so on so um so i think there's a, a big opportunity like uh probably not in like the you know very near future like i'm thinking like this kind of stuff is five or ten years out but uh for like massive amounts of uh data collection and sensor networks that are basically happening happen happening on moons that are then shared in a way that still preserves privacy to whatever degree is possible using things like homomorphic encryption and zero knowledge proofs. And, uh, and this can give us a better sort of resource uh, informed way to understand how our world works and like how different resources are converted to one another. You know, where does, where does, uh, you know, like there's a lot of things in like, if you buy like certain products, like they say, Oh, like, Oh, the, this herb came from this farm, that herb came from that farm. And that's kind of all done at like, you know, a high level of like, someone has to like, you know, keep track of all this kind of stuff. Well, if you like, uh, if you could actually push that kind of information down into like the level of the data being collected, uh, um, and like understand ways in which different data composes, then you would be able to like, for example, like scan a product in a supermarket and like find out how much carbon went into like, you know, its production, uh, just by following the, uh, resource chain. And I think, uh, th this is another idea that like kind of is around the hollow chain world. Um, it hasn't really penetrated into Urbit much cause they, they're, they're just focused on different things, but, um, this is, uh, also, uh, plays into, uh, the ideas in the paper that we'll talk about next time. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Excellent. So, are there any interesting applications being developed at the moment or anyone even just thinking about even little toy applications when it comes to Internet of Things, moons, Urbit? So, for instance, like if I put a, if I put a moon on a Raspberry Pi in my house, is there anything cool or interesting that, I, that one could do at the moment? Or is this all very speculative and in the future? Basically all speculative right now. I think uh, there's a couple of people that I know have... Uh, done these couple of concrete things in this direction. Um, uh, Litmus written runs Internet Weirdness uh, Task Force. Uh, he's made, 
uh, a moon that I believe works as a CO2 sensor and it's actually Raspberry Pi inside like an actual like 3D printed moon. Um, and uh, and then there's another uh, person who's I'm trying to check my messages right now if I can remember who he is. Um, ah, yeah, his name is Pat P is. Uh, pill like pill like fast deck uh or and um he apparently he's a, a professional has worked in iot that i i've talked to a little bit basically as a result of writing that article um and he's interested in more uh home iot stuff with like having different systems of permissions based off of like facial recognition and stuff but i think he's just working on like a paper right now that kind of proposes these ideas and not actually the software level um, but then, uh, personally I've been, uh, I have, I have some projects in mind for this that I've done like a lot of the design work on, but I haven't really written much of the code for yet, uh, with basically having to do with controlling a Arduino using an Urbit. And for listeners who aren't familiar with an Arduino, uh, this is basically a, uh, very, very simple type of computer. That's like, you know, with like a 200 megahertz processor, maybe like 64 kilobytes of Ram or something, um, that you generally just use for a single purpose, like, you know, run these lights or send these radio signals, something like that. Um, and they're very universal in the sense, sense they have a lot of like, there's lots and lots of different types of things you can add, add, add to them, like different types of sensors and like motors, actuators. Uh, so you can do lots with them. And there's, uh, and basically the, uh, Coolest way to do this, uh, have an Urbit talk to and control an Arduino would be to basically do it directly over like a USB serial line or something. But the the simplest thing to do that could probably be done in like a weekend uh, by someone who knows what they're doing is basically uh, have uh, the Arduino export the functions that are on it uh, to a HTTP client that is running on it. And then or um, and then you're. Your Urbit uh, uses uh, the HTTP server abilities on it to basically just send send commands to the Arduino over HTTP, which, um, you know, so it's kind of uh, uh, it's a little bit a little bit hacky. It's not as like, you know, robust as it could could be, but um, it's doable. And like one of the things like I've been working on a project with uh, involving LEDs for the past like year and a half now, it's been like my big quarantine project uh, where basically I have a bunch of Arduinos running a bunch of LEDs and what I'd like to do at some point uh, is make it basically make it so that anybody could send a poke to like a, 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 a moon running on the, so there's a Raspberry Pi that controls these Arduinos right now, but it'd be cool if anybody on the Urbit network could send a poke to that Raspberry Pi with like a message. And like, cause one of the things on this is like a scrolling like LED ticker tape thing and they could send a message to it and then it just appears on the LED screen. And I think that's very doable. And I, uh, you know, it's, on my to-do list of uh, things for this year. I'm getting, uh, but there's a lot of other aspects of the project and, but it's just kind of a toy, a toy at the moment, but you know, everything, most, uh, my experience with science is that most cool things start off as just like toys. And it's just like, I just want to see what I can do with it, like, you know, bare minimum working thing and then see where we can go from there. Totally. Yeah. It's a great attitude. And I guess in the long run, you would imagine this kind of thing scaling up into, it's kind of like, People will have all these moons around them, maybe on their body, maybe in their home. And these are presumably linking up with other people's sensors in these kinds of private, federated machine learning applications, probably, where instead of ha instead of like submitting all of your data to Google, where now Google runs all these sophisticated uh, machine learning algorithms to then supply us with services, which are often pretty cool, right? It leverages all of our data that it steals from us basically to make some pretty cool badass product products that do give us a lot of leverage in life. In, in the long run of Urbit, we still are having all these sensors sending data to intelligent applications, giving us leverage for the things we do in our life, but it's presumably under completely opt-in circumstances where you're doing kind of federated machine learning across many orbits strictly within networks that are private to you that you want to be a part of is that am i thinking about that in the right way yeah yeah totally um and uh yeah i think that's one of the uh 
main ultimate things that Urbits will become is sort of personal AI assistance. Like you'll, your, your Urbit will run an AI, you know, and because it knows about all your data, it'll be able to give you recommendations for, for various things that, you know, are actually tuned to what you want. So it's unlike, you know, the like recommendation algorithm on like YouTube or something where its goal is to get you to just watch as long as possible. Uh, you know, you might be able to tell, tell your Urbit like, okay, you know, recommend me some things, uh, that I want to, that I, I would be interested in, but, uh, you know, hopefully like we'd be able to tune it so that, you know, don't trap me in like a dopamine feedback loop where I just watch YouTube for 12 hours or something, um, which, you know, that's obviously a hard problem, but that's also the reason that, that that's not done at all right now is just because of the misaligned incentives of whenever you have a third party that's in between like 100% of your communication, like they're always going to want to, uh, make use of the fact that they're the third party there. And so they're not going to have your best intentions uh, or your best interests at, at heart. And um, right. But yeah, I think uh, like, you know, my super duper way future, like crazy idea about like where Urbit would go in this direction is that, you know, everybody has an Urbit. They have their own personal AIs, all their sensor networks all over the planet that are, you know, semi-private and federated in, in a way and like using zero knowledge proofs and so on. And then you're using uh, algorithms that are inspired by how natural systems like uh, like forests or brains and so on to kind of form a sort of like global neural network that uh, is able to understand how resources on the planet are being converted from one into one to one into another and allows you to make like, you know, predictions of like, oh, if I do these actions, how is this going to affect, you know, my my uh, personal, uh, you know, social bubble and how is it affect society greater at large? And, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, the sort of like, I guess, uh, I, you know, and I and I do actually have uh, concrete ideas in this direction, which is what I talk about next time this. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, for this time, we'll just have to tease it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. That's fine. Uh, yeah. For for people watching and listening, uh, Pop Rocks is working on a formal paper with a co-author where you both are working on these things in more detail. And we'll bring you back on the show when, when that paper drops. I would love to hear from both of you in more detail. So the final thing that I want to ask you about is politics and Urbit, because there's this crazy misconception, which is, which is very widespread, that that Urbit has is like this intrinsically neo-reactionary architecture or something mm -hmm. like this. It's, it's it's a widespread misconception. But your work in complex systems and swarm dynamics and and these types of topics have actually suggested many possibilities where Urbit actually. Uh, supports different types of governance structures, different types of governance norms. I think at, at certain points you even talk about or write about kind of anarcho-communist dynamics being quite consistent with Urbit. So could you unpack that a little bit? Tell, tell us a little bit about how your research opens up into certain political expectations on how power is likely to be distributed on Urbit in the long run? Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm not a huge expert on uh, neo-reactionary thought, but that definitely was, at least for me, a big uh, initial mental barrier to get over when I started with Urbit because of this kind of misconception that it creates a feudal internet structure. Um, but then once you like look at the current internet from the right perspective, then it becomes apparent that the current internet is actually the feudal one. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> totally. Jack, yeah. Jack is king of Twitter and Zuckerberg's king of fa Facebook and like everybody on those websites are basically their serfs. So um, it's obvious to me that if it was the intention was to create a feudal internet, then, well, th it already succeeded. And that's what we're currently living in. Um, the uh, But yeah, it's like I, I think Urban is actually about as politically neutral as like a hammer. And this is, was said, you know, uh, to some extent by Galen at the assembly, but he's also said this a lot of, a lot in general is that, you know, the intention is urban is just, you know, it's to be a, a tool and tools aren't inherently political, um, kind of thing. You can use them for a lot of different things if they are actually tools. Um, like there are a lot of things that could be claimed to be tools that, you know, kind of push one way or the other, but like, uh, you know, and my, my perspective, you know, as, like you said, uh, uh, I consider myself some kind of like anarcho communist, um, but, you know, kind of, uh, you know, in, in a way that would take a while to explain. But um, but uh, that, you know, if somebody if, if you were in like, you know, a war a long time ago and the other side invented guns, you would be very foolish not to like adopt guns yourself. 
Uh, and I yeah. see the kind of the same thing is true with Urbit is that I mostly just think of it as an agency enhancing technology and that it allows you to create new types of signal complexes and ways to organize people and like what types of signals you can create because it's like a Turing complete system is completely open ended. And um, that uh, the only like part of it that, you know, like there is like a hierarchical address system, but the reason that that uh, once I understood it, like didn't bother me was uh, a, because it's, you know, mostly just for peer discovery, but also uh nat punching. And so it's like, it's, and then mathematically a hierarchical routing system is just the most efficient. Um, so, and then the other thing is that, okay, we do need to be able to modify the PKA over time, which is a very hard governance problem. So there is like the galaxy system for that. And you could have a lot of other systems, but there's, um, I think a lot of ways in which, uh, Urbit could evolve in the, you know, far future, like I'm saying, like 10, 20 plus years away into having multiple PKIs where it's like maybe some sort of political issue arises with the governance of the PKI. And so someone launches a new one. I mean, actually this already happened. Like in, there's a, there is another Urbit you can look up online. Somebody sells galaxies for it for like a dollar or sorry, a Bitcoin or something. Um, oh really? Yeah. Uh, and that's funny. Um, but yeah. And, but the thing is that, you know, okay. It, having another PKI would create another entire network. Uh, but uh, if it was sufficiently similar to Urbit uh, in a way that I think like eventually we're probably gonna have like multiple distributions. So it's sort of similar to how Linux is. So we'll have to have some standards for how that should be structured. Um, but Urbit's got a good circumstance for that uh, is that you could use, uh, there's an app, there's a few ways to do this, but my favorite one that I, uh, that I know of so far is uh, there's an app on Urbit called Aqua, where it's basically, you can like simulate uh, other ships inside of your ship. So it's like, you know, just creating more Urbit virtual machines inside of your Urbit virtual machine. And you could use these to represent messages from an alternate PKI that, you know, someone sends in a message from that PKI and then your ship just receives it as coming from inside of uh, your instance of Aqua that you'd have like one instance of this thing where it's just like, you know, a little like, uh, you know, just simulation of a network inside of your Urbit. And so you'd have one for each PKI and it, you know, it'd be harder to interact across like apps and such. And, uh, but, but basically I think because uh, that, and as well as the fact that it's also completely trivial to fork the, the, the PKI and that ultimately at the end of the day, your own ship decides how it interprets the PKI. So that means that if you and a bunch of friends all decided that you wanted to use what's up bitches, which is my favorite ship to use in, as an example, uh, as a galaxy, because all different ships like run are running the exact same, um, the exact same software, uh, treating another ship like as a galaxy for like routing purposes is as simple as like changing a few lines of code. And so the, I think of the PKI and the routing structure as really just being, uh, sensible default suggestions like it's the mathematically most efficient one and then the governance system is is probably too simplistic but you know that's just designed to evolve over time and that i think that from a game theory point of view that the power of the pkii is basically held in the users at large because of the ability to fork it and because ultimately end of the day your ship decides how it interprets the data on it um, and so I think, okay. and I think most people's accusations of the, of, of Urbit being like neo-reactionary are related to the structure of the PKI, which is why I'm focusing on it. Okay. Fascinating. And what about just the distribution of power within the network as it evolves, or let's even imagine in the, in the long run steady state of, of Urbit mass adoption is how do you expect power to be distributed? Do you, do you expect it to be a lot of democratic structures kind of liquid liquid democracy patterns or or maybe even anarcho communist swarm dynamics or you know or are is there a concern that there's going to be this uh kind of centralization of power and there will be these big landholders kind of you know kind of like in uh in feudal structures uh and and what are kind of your first principles reasons for for thinking about these things uh what frameworks do you use to uh, to build a mental model of how power is, is distributed in the long run on the urban network. Well, uh, this is where I, you know, I'll say a little bit, but I would say my idea here or my conception isn't very well developed yet. Um, but, uh, yeah, so my, my general hypothesis behind why I'm fine with working on urban, despite being some type of leftist is that I think that, uh, Yarvin is correct about how power works in a short term, but that I think it's actually, Power is an emergent effect of when 
the base level signaling systems aren't sophisticated enough to encode what is needed for society to run. So that I think that if you have more more sophisticated levels of like signals that encode more data directly about like your environment and the resources and the social connections, all that kind of stuff, then it becomes less and less necessary for people to defer to uh, um, like uh, people that have power as, as it, to make uh, decisions. And so that's why I think that, uh, you know, this idea about, um, uh, this idea about having lots of, um, ways to produce like new signals and such is, is actually, you know, very empowering for the individual and that it, uh, takes away reasons for higher, uh, you know, people that are more powerful to exist. And because, because, you know, ultimately, you know, people that are, are, I guess, I guess, subject to someone else are, are, um, I don't know, I guess there's a lot of, complicated reasons for it. And I'm probably not going to do a very good job explaining it. And, uh, I, this would be a good question to ask, uh, uh, my co-author and I on the, on the next one. Cause I, she, she is much more well versed in like anarchist, uh, ideas about power and such than me, than me. I'm, I'm mostly just like the, the, the geek who's just thinks nature is cool and that we should try to copy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, fair but, enough. That, that's great. But, that gives us something to chew on yeah, next time. As I, I well. guess there's so one other thing I wanted fun. to add, which is that I think yeah. like top down hierarchical power structures are ultimately a bottleneck for how fast the system can process information. And that because society is getting more and more complex over time, that bottleneck becomes more important over time. And so if you are have like some systems that are like sort of pyramidal power structures and have some that are really decentralized bottom up ones that once the signaling complex gets sophisticated enough that um, the top down ones are going to run into this information processing bottleneck and the uh, distrib- decentralized ones will be able to handle it better. And my evidence for that is just that when you look into natural complex systems, there's no top down systems. Uh, and so and, and, and like molecular biology and all the and ecology and stuff, those are all extremely uh, complicated things. And so I feel that if 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 it were best that for that to be handled in a top down way, then nature might have evolved like that. But OK, so basically what you're saying is that as the entire network will be incentivized to optimize for network, the network speed, yeah, the for, network's for quality. In, for optimize for information processing. Yeah. And this is something that, uh, yeah, uh, Matilda, my co-author has actually written a lot about. So yeah, we'll save it for next time. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, just, just to encapsulate the point for people, if I'm hearing it correctly, if the network is forced to optimize for itself, for its speed, for its, its performance, then that itself is going to militate against, uh, hierarchical, you know, centralized feudalistic types of, of, of power dynamics simply because that creates bottlenecks. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. We'll, we'll, we'll have tons of time to go into that in great detail uh, next time when we bring you on with the co-author. This is a perfect kind of teaser for that. So I think this will be very interesting for, you know, people who are curious about Urbit, but are maybe on the political left or there's kind of, you know, they've heard some negative things about, you know, whatever the, the architecture. And so this was really illuminating. Uh, This was awesome. Uh, Paparax, I really appreciate you coming on. Was there anything that maybe I should have asked you, which I didn't, anything about quantum computing or Urbit or the the topics we discussed that you feel is particularly interesting or important to impart to the audience that maybe I didn't think to ask? Uh, I think I think we covered uh, a good amount for this one. Uh, this is, is, is there's a lot of dense information. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, totally. It was it was great. I think my audience is really going to like this. So thank you so much for your time, Jonathan. I appreciate it. And I'll put links to your Pat P uh, in the show notes so people can reach out to you if they want on Urbit. And yeah, I just want to thank you again. This was awesome. All right. Yeah, it's great to hang out.